Hello, my name is Jacob Gray, and I'm the Senior Director of the Wharton Social Impact Initiative. And I'm happy, actually delighted, to be here with Dr. Judith Roden, who is the president of the Rockefeller Foundation and a past president of the University of Pennsylvania. And we're here to talk about her book, The Power of Impact Investing, which was co-authored with Margot Brandenburg. So welcome, Dr. Thank Roden. Thank you. I know a lot of people have heard the term impact investing. Not everyone knows what it means. So just from a high level to start out, can you, can you sketch out for us what impact investing is? Right. It's the intention to produce both a social or environmental and a financial return. So it's a conscious investment that really looks for a double bottom line. Okay. So in the book, you talk about impact investing as existing on this continuum with traditional grant making over here and traditional financial investing over here. And um, so my question is, are, are impact investors people who are coming at this from more the grant making perspective and they're trying to find new ways to do good? Or are they coming from the traditional finance perspective trying to make their capital work harder? As the field started to develop, mm -hmm. it was either people who were investing philanthropically through grants, through family foundations or other kinds of, of grant making, mm -hmm. um, who were looking for ways to develop further flows of capital where they could use their grant making potentially to help bring in another kind of investor, sometimes by de-risking the investment yes. or being that first tier of concessionary financing and then allowing another investor to come in. And they found that that helped to build the field and, mm -hmm. and build that capacity. And in fact, the term impact investing was developed at the Rockefeller Bellagio Conference Center in 2007 when we convened a group of investors to talk about what they had learned working in the space. Interestingly, Jacob, we've been working more recently around the world mm -hmm. um, rather than just in Europe and North America. And what we are finding is the gateway in Asia, the gateway in Latin America, and I think in Africa too, is from the financial investor who is becoming more socially responsible in mm. his or her own country. Okay. And really is starting to think, well, I know how to do the financial and maybe I can put that money to work for social purpose. Okay, all right, that's really interesting. So it's a different angle. Um, so, you know, in the, in the book, you cite the example of D-Light, the, the solar technology company, which I think is a really accessible example of a social impact enterprise. In other words, an enterprise in which impact investors put their money. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how that company works and how it's, what its social theory of change is? Um, its theory of change is that uh, electricity poverty mm -hmm. is one of the root causes of poverty globally. And it poverty. really, so people who have no source of lighting that is reliable, they tend to use kerosene or they can't have any lighting at night or they burn wood and that's environmentally mm -hmm. uh, unsustainable. And so how do we get either solar or other battery light that doesn't come from solar, but some way to really allow these people, often in very remote areas of the world, to have access to lighting. And they started as a very small, almost flashlight model idea. Mm. Yeah. And then we ran a competition for them um, because they wanted to know, could they scale their technology to light a whole room with the kind of technology that they already had? And we ran a global competition through Innocentive, which is a platform that has inventors from yes. around the world registered, and they compete to win a prize. And the winner was uh, somebody in China, and they helped them to develop the technology that allows that to light a room. So that allowed them to go to scale. And then impact investors started coming in, and, and now they are a phenomenal example. So. That's one example mm -hmm. that is where there's direct investment into a social enterprise. And that's wonderful for some kind of impact investors. And we give a lot of those examples in yes. the book. I mean, people who want to touch and feel the enterprise. Yes. They want to help them. They, have, they are themselves um, wealthy enough. They have sources of capital, but they really want to engage 
with the enterprise and they want to see and feel the outcome of the work. Yeah. But not every impact investor is like that. Okay. Some impact investors really have very strong views about social purpose, but some feel that they don't have the time or the experience or the energy, frankly, to engage that deeply with the enterprise itself. And so there's grown just as there is in the financial only mm -hmm. industry funds um, that are investing in these social enterprises that do the social and the financial due diligence. And the investors then invest in the funds. Sonin Capital is a very well-known one now, yes. but there are many others. Um, great funds, exciting, and so they can really use those opportunities um, to make uh, impact investments, but in a traditional investor way. Mm -hmm. So I, we've, I've noticed in the field, so I've, I was an impact investor for 14 years before I came to Wharton, and uh, over time the field has really professionalized and changed. And you know I've noticed in the funds, whereas fund managers, way back when I started might have been more like the executive director of a nonprofit type. Mm -hmm. Now we're seeing something different. We're seeing um, people who come, I mean, if you can if you talk a little oh, bit yes. about what the, the, the sophistication of the industry now. Well, the reason that that's important is twofold. One, the sophistication of the industry is helping it to grow. Yeah. Um, so we have very experienced people now who are uh, experienced investors doing it. Um, but it also is a stamp of approval. We're seeing mm. people leave yes. from Goldman or J.P. Morgan or you know the, the traditional yes. investment um, banks and move into this space in really interesting ways. Uh, my favorite group is a, is a group who invented the social impact bonds, social, Im uh, social Finance UK. Oh, yes. And those are young folks who went the investment banking route um, and stayed for about eight or 12 years. And then with the um, leadership of Sir Ronald Cohen in the UK, started social finance and invented this amazing impact investment instrument different from a fund and different from investing in a social enterprise Which has now been copied called Social Impact Bonds. All over the world. I mean, it's been... And we, we, Rockefeller, funded bringing it to other places in the world, and we, we're scaling it in the U.S. That's very exciting. Yeah. I, I often, I was thinking about what you're saying about the this uh, stamp of approval from new people in the field, and often I tell students that I would never make it in, into this field at this point as I did back then because <laughs> I don't have their credentials. Um, so... Uh, it, can you talk a little bit more about the overall scale? I mean, how big of an industry is this? And and why is it, what's the promise that's so exciting to you at the Rockefeller Foundation? Rockefeller got interested in this because we are so clear when you look at the magnitude of philanthropy around the world, which is enormous and wonderful, and you add to it the magnitude of development assistance that comes from individual countries, mm -hmm. um, such as USAID in the US or DFID in the UK and, yes. and so many others around the world. When you add those together, it doesn't get to the trillions of dollars that we're going to need to solve the social mm -hmm. and environmental problems. And I mean this really broadly because yes. I call crumbling infrastructure in the United States a social problem. Um, and so it's, it's a broad category. Yeah. And we realize that unless we really catalyze the private sector and private capital, um, we're not going to solve all of the social problems. And that when you bring in private capital, you bring in market forces mm -hmm. to what are sort of philanthropic do-good impulses. And we feel that's really important. It is wonderful to feel good it is very important to do good, but it is most important to have impact. And so it, it's been a combination in a very interesting way of unleashing private capital, but unleashing market force thinking mm -hmm. into this field. And it will never replace philanthropy and grant making, nor should it. Philanthropic capital is America's risk capital, yeah. after all. It's our tax advantage dollars. So. We ought to be doing the most risky pilots. We ought to be taking that most uh, risky tier if we're doing concessionary financing. And we've put in, like we put in a, with a, another group of foundations, a $50 million first tier 
about 15 years ago for the Bloomberg administration to build affordable housing yes. because the commercial banks wouldn't lend for the acquisition and pre-construction costs. So we guaranteed the banks the first 50 million of risk, and then they put in 350 million, and the affordable housing started to be built. So there's so many ways that grants and concessionary financing will always be useful. But you see in these impact investors, people who are very sophisticated financially, and what we did and what we talk about in the book is that we saw the market failure and why the field wasn't accelerating yes. quickly enough was that a lot of them said, well, I know how to do the financial due diligence, but I don't know how to do the social due diligence. So what does social impact look like? How will mm -hmm. I measure it? How will I know that I've succeeded? So we at Rockefeller invested in most of the metrics that are currently being used by the field, the impact rating system and the global impact rating right. system that rates both the performance of the funds and rates the social impact, potential social impact of the social enterprise. Yeah, so I wanna, I wanna get to a question about the critics of this industry. Um, one of them, I mean, maybe the more pithy ones was Mark Andreessen of the venture capital firm Andreessen Horowitz said, uh, you know, they compared impact investing to a houseboat. It's neither, he said, it's neither a great house nor a great boat. So, uh, pithiness aside, um, is there some sort of inherent tension between the desire to, to push toward purpose and, and the push toward profit? Is there any fiduciary duty risk or, or pressure that, um, that's intention here. Yes, so there absolutely is a tension. Mm -hmm. And that's why, just as I said, we never want to stop grant making. Mm -hmm. We never want to stop innovative venture capitalists like Mark and Ben mm -hmm. from being a financial only investor. Yes. But this is for that category that says, and Mark is a great philanthropist and a friend of mine. Mm -hmm. And so he is investing, making a lot of money, and then with his wife, Laura, giving philanthropically. And that's a wonderful thing to do. Yes. And that's the traditional model. Right. So Mark doesn't like when I use the word traditional, but it <laughs> is. Because he's a venture capitalist, right? right? That's the old school <laughs> model. But there's lots of people now who yeah. really want to be in between, are willing to take a somewhat lower rate on financial return. Look. Fixed income is a lower rate, right. and so it's for it's it's never going to be triple digit, um, but there are double digit um, impact investing funds. For example, Generation Capital, sure. which is a pool of public equities that do alternative energy, um, is turning double digit returns. Mm -hmm. The Rockefeller Endowment has a traditional investment in them, and so there are some. But most are not. Yes. And there's a wide and widening pool of investors who are willing to take fixed income rates in order to have high social return. And the impact investment, as you know well, also runs along a continuum. So mm -hmm. there's financial first with social second and vice versa. So you can sort of mix the pie in whatever way meets your both social purpose and um, investment goals. And I think people love that. I, so I do too, and I, particularly perhaps among the younger generations. I and mean, I, I wonder if you also see this, but, I, but we see, at least among Wharton students, we see this, uh, that impact investing has gone from uh, a sort of oddity to a really highly respected side pursuit, and now to what people see as really a nascent, or maybe it's just proto-nascent industry. And you know, the students are actually paying attention like they could actually get a job in this field. Absolutely, and so we see surveys after survey. JP Morgan and the GIN, the uh, Global Impact Investors Network that we help to start surveys every year, and they have um, a group of impact investors. And so between 13, 2013 and 2014, the amount that was being invested by this group that's being surveyed went up 19 percent um, from wow. about 10.6 billion to 12.7 billion or something in that range. So it went up 19 percent. 91 percent of them said that they had met their financial objectives and 99 percent said that their investment had met their social objectives. 
So we're seeing, I think through the development of networks, I think through the development of metrics mm -hmm. and sharing data and more performance data now coming out from older funds, yes. such as those that yeah. you worked on and others early in the game, are really bringing more people into the field. And young people are so excited about this. And, you know, they see the world in need of change and they want to touch and feel it. And if they can use capital to make that happen, um, in a really constructive way, I think it's very attractive. I think, I, I think so too. So just as a closing question, what's next in this field? I mean, what's going to be the next big jump or the next lever? Is it a, is it a public policy that needs to be built around it or, or, or what? Yes, the next big jump will certainly come through public policy because right now, ERISA requirements, for example, in the United States and some comparable types of legislation el elsewhere prevent um, many of the pension funds from taking large yes. positions in impact investing funds because it doesn't meet the hurdle of the financial return that they need to, to address. At one point, the ERISA requirements were lower and then Congress raised them again mm -hmm. about 20 years ago. So as this field matures and as government starts to see that maybe it can attract this kind of capital, as the UK government saw in the development of the social impact bond, which is really getting a private investor to pay for a public program yes. like recidivism or health or whatever, then I think public policy around all of this will change and that will have an absolutely accelerating effect on the field because it will unleash uh, significant amounts of potential capital. Catalytic, I would mm -hmm. think. Yeah. So, Dr. Roden, mm -hmm. thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to come to back to campus <laughs> and join us for this interview. I thank you so much. It's always great to be here. Thank you, Jacob. <laughs>